What's up guys, Headphones New here, back with my review for The Mandalorian Season 2, and in this case is Episode 8, The Rescue. So, for this particular review, it's going to definitely be very spoiler-filled. Um, I'm going to do a quick go-through of the episode itself, and um, some of the key points that I thought of interest or um, of note, interesting, and all of that. And then the one bit of... Um, oddness and oddity at the end of the episode and it kind of hold, it's kind of or it was slightly it was kind of drawing the difference between another star wars film so i will bring that up when that comes up as well so with that let's get right into it so in this episode we as the title suggests we have the mandalorian um out to rescue grogu from uh, Moff Gideon, so he kidnaps the scientist who's been running the test to get the to get Grogu's blood, and um, basically, as far as we know, test his force, see if they can use his force power stuff into other entities and beings. Um, they get him, and then they end up going to recruit or er, Mando and Cruz Mando, Fett and um, Ming Na go to uh, recruit. Um, Bo-Katan and her sidekick friend. Uh, they initially decline, but they make a deal with each other that if um, Bo-Katan helps Mando get Grogu back, then um, they'll help with reclaiming Mandalore and won't get in the way and all of that stuff. So kind of a twofold deal, kind of the forest for the trees kind of thing. So they make that deal. Uh, we did get a pretty cool uh, mini fight scene here between um, Boba and um, uh, Koska, the sidekick for Bo Katan, so I thought it was pretty cool. But we did bring, um, or Bo Katan did bring it up that they can't fight, or there can no longer be any more in fighting if they're to reclaim Mandalore. And I did like the little interaction where Boba kept referring to Bo Katan as princess, kind of harkened back to Han Solo calling uh, Princess Leia princess all the time to irritate the crap out of her, so overall pretty good interaction there. Um, and then we have them formulating the, the plan to get Grogu. They do understand that they're going to be the, the distraction while Mando gets re or rescues Grogu. Um, in the rescue scene, I do like that Moth Gideon was... Um, he did anticipate that they would come in the force that they did in the way they did, and that bo -Katan would be there, so he ends up going to um, keep Grogu that he's not going to, um, or he's not going to give him up so easily, but he makes a deal with Mando, which I thought was pretty interesting and kind of deceptive on Mando's part, but it worked out really well, and I think it went over easier because he's wearing his helmet and he's built his reputation for wanting to survive at all costs, so I liked that deal that they made, and because they fight it, or the fight scene comes into play later, which I'll get to at that point, but I do like that the Dark Troopers were recruited, and we get more, or kind of a further indication to me that of the influence of Jon Favreau, because he was an Iron Man, that they have a very Iron Man feel, or kind of Iron Monger, I forget the bad guy's name in the first one, but it felt a lot like an Iron Man suit or an Iron Legion suit with a limited Jarvis and Ultron AI, so kind of what the Iron Legion was, but more but using it for evil purposes. So, um, overall, a pretty interesting scene there. They kind of they did do a whole lot more than the last episode where they were on Tython, but we do kind of see their strength and how difficult they are to kill. And I did find it interesting that Mando used a killing, the same killing technique that Obi-Wan used in Episode 3 against General Grievous, but it didn't work. So it feels like Thrawn fixed, or sorry, not Thrawn, but Gideon fixed that whole issue that he made it um, harder for anyone to kill the Dark Troopers that way. So um, in that fight, um, it was very intriguing because we have uh, Mando fighting uh, Gideon with a Beskar stick and Gideon fighting with the Darksaber so he does have the f sword fighting skills so I'm kind of curious to see if Gideon um, has been learning from Thrawn as far as his deductive skills 
Because when you if you have if you've read the Thrawn novels and you know that Thrawn likes to impart his deductive reasoning to his subordinates and people he works with, so I think Eli Vance is his um, assistant's name. So, he, and then the various other people is with he he likes to share that um, deductive reasoning skill so that others can see things the way he does and think outside the box. And so that brings us to the big spoiler for the show. And I will say that I was wrong about what spoiler we were gonna or what we were gonna get for this episode. So we definitely did not get Thrawn, but we do get the introduction of Luke Skywalker to save the day. So he does come in along the or it had a very episode six Revenge of or Return of the Jedi feel to it. So um he comes in fighting the dark troopers very slowly, very methodically along the lines of when he came and entered Jabba's palace. So he did enter, he tried to use reasoning and um, communication, but he did um, fight, he essentially fight, fought his way in, in both cases, um, slowly and methodically. And um, when we see his full silhouette in the doorway of the ship in uh, Mandalorian, it was kind of along the lines of his silhouette in Return of the Jedi, but less so than that, it was more along the lines of Vader's silhouette in Rogue One. So I thought that was pretty cool, and if you go back and watch those scenes, you'll see that our, I think the sabers were in their same hands, but in different directions, but I just thought it was a very cool silhouette and, and um, visual that we got to see. It, basically like father like son but in this case we have one as a sith and one as a jedi so a pretty cool scene there um and of course i was i got to thinking once we saw him and it was for sure that we we knew it was luke that i was wondering if he was going to come in with r2d2 and of course we did see him and he was very happy to see grogu so i thought that was a nice little touch because of course grogu is of the same species species as yoda and he, they look very much alike, so I'm guessing R2 was thinking that maybe they might be the same, or he knew who Yoda was, so he was happy to see um, someone that he was very familiar with. Um, so overall, that interaction went pretty well, and um, Grogu was, a, or, we, or as Mando seems to have thought, he was kind of voicing our opi same opinions, that Grogu might have been scared to go with Luke, but Luke let, basically said out loud what, to answer the question that... Um, he was asking Mando's permission that if it was okay for him to go with Luke and Mando lets him go and he does let him know to not be afraid or he says something along the lines of don't be afraid so that kind of harkened back to episode 3 or sorry episode 1 again when Anakin is leaving to go with Qui-Gon that Shmila tells him to not let, to let go and um, not to be afraid. So I thought there were a lot of parallels there, but I think in this case, um, it's gonna, I wanna say it's gonna be a little bit better that Grogu's afraid to let go, but because he's been out in the universe with Mando, he knows what's out there, he knows of the evils that exist, and he's better prepared than Anakin was. Um, Anakin was not as, um, prepared because he was, I mean, he was strong in the force, and he had a strong will about him, but he was not prepared for all the evil that was out there, so it kind of overwhelmed him when he got out there. And then he also had someone like Palpatine um, pulling the strings to get him to go to the dark side, whereas Mando was more matter-of-fact, down-to-earth, and was protecting him along those against his, those kinds of things. So, overall, a pretty good episode. Um, I was kind of bummed that we got uh, Luke so early, but I'm also not disappointed with how, with how he was presented, so I'm kind of curious to see what where they take it from here, or if that was kind of the way that the showrunners wanted to have Grogu exit from the show so they could return to focusing on um, the Mandalorian and maybe more of the Mandalorian culture and bringing the Mandalorians back together, or even fo or maybe shift their focus on Mandalore itself and focus on that story arc, so We'll see where they go from here and um, see how all that goes. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, so the two or the two things to note now that we're done with um, the episode proper, and is that since Boba, or sorry, since Mando fought with um, Gideon and won the dark saber, now uh, it brought in some lore from the Clone Wars that um, is of note in that 
since uh, Mando has the um, dark saber, he has a claim to the throne of Mandalore. Where if um, Bo Katan wants it, they have to fight, and um, she has to defeat Mando in order to uh, claim the throne for herself. So um, I'm kind of curious to see what they're going to do from here, or if maybe they're going to help each other out and reclaim the throne, but Bo Katan remains in a position of power and does not rule, or something along those lines, or if they're going to fight it out. But I did like that. Um, Mando does not want to claim the throne, so he ends up just saying he'll yield and tries to give the sword saber to Bo Katan. But that doesn't work; they actually have to fight it out. So I thought that was pretty interesting there. So I'm kind of curious what they do next season about that. Um, and then finally, the one thing that I did not like about the Luke Skywalker introduction was the animations that they used for his fighting. So the his fighting style, or sorry, his face. Um, the fighting style was okay. It kind of worked. He was, um, he did what he needed to, needed to do. It's only a few years after Return of the Jedi, so he may or may not want to go full speed, or maybe he's because it's close quarter combat. He's taking his time and he's being methodical about it. But when we have his facial animations when he's talking to Mando and Grogu, his eyes seemed kind of dead. So. They seem kind of far out and distant, so it felt like they were drawing a difference between um, Grand Moff Tarkin and Princess Leia from Rogue One. So it kind of felt kind of strange when he was looking and talking. And then his mouth movements felt like those uh, memes where you have um, static images, but they have the lips moving, or they have only the lips moving. So it kind of felt very strange when he was talking, and I kind of didn't like that because I was hoping that they would have had a live action actor in that role or um as the internet's wanting to do have sebastian stand in that role and have a full and proper um actor in that role so i kind of didn't like that they did that i mean it felt strange and i'm not and when i go back and rewatch the episode i kind of want to see um if it if i see that same thing again but when I was watching it the first time, it definitely did not stand, or it definitely did stand out that something was off about it, and it felt as if they were trying to mask, um, or trying to, you know, have an actor, but overlay some sort of something else over it. But I did like that they used the voice of Mark Hamill, so it was nice to have that kind of auditory consistency, but the visual of it kind of felt off, so... Um, I'll have to see if that holds up over time, but I will say if it's anything like Rogue One, um, I did, um, warm up to Grand Moff Tarkin, so that looked better over time, but Princess Leia did not, so, um, one of those things that's a strange oddity in the way things happen, so, um, as I said, I'll have to go back and see if it still holds up in a second viewing, but in the first viewing, it definitely did stand out. So that's all for um, the episode proper. So uh, the one thing to note in this episode is that there is a post credit scene. So when you get to the credits, you'll know that note that there's no concept art. But at the point of the credits, I think there's something like seven to nine minutes left. So if you stay through the credits, you'll see that or you'll get an extra bonus scene on Tatooine at Jabba's palace. So we have Mando and Fennec Shand at, um, launching an assault on the palace. And we see a now old Bib Fortuna who has gained a lot of weight and looks like he's been living the good life or maybe he's in some sort of depression and eating a lot. I don't know, but um, in any case, he's um, gained a lot of weight and Mando takes him out and ends up sitting on the throne, I guess, or the dais. So overall, it was a pretty intriguing scene and we close with the... Uh, Note saying the book of Fett is coming in December 2021, so I'm kind of curious to see, or I'll have to do, or I haven't done the research, but I'm gonna, I want, I'm gonna see if um, this is gonna be a secondary show where it's gonna be only about Boba Fett and his exploits since uh, Return of the Jedi, or even since the Clone Wars, or something along those lines, and how he's been keeping track of his adventure since whatever time they decide to start or if season three is going to be um a chronicle of his adventures with um the mandalorian and if this is the scene at some point in the future where it's um future events that um 
where this is, you know, it's finally time for him to retire. So I'm going to actually need to rewatch that um, scene again to see if um, his armor has um, been worn down again over time or if he's gained weight or lost weight or something along those lines. I didn't notice it, the, notice anything unusual the first time in watching it, but I am kind of curious to see how they, if they do make it a spinoff show or if they make season three of the mandalorian about um boba fett or if they the book of fett is going to be about um his adventures with mando and the rest of the mandalorians like bo katan and the rest and how they recalling mandalore and if his reclamation of um jabba's palace is kind of his prize for helping them out and he can now rule in his own empire or something along those lines but that is all for this particular episode so um if you want to get in touch with me you can find me on twitter at patel n01 for feedback um comments suggestions your thoughts on the episode or the season as well or even on past episodes and all of that good stuff you can find the website at patel n01.com for subscription links past episodes supporting the show and all of that good stuff. And of course, if you're a patron, then you will, you got my initial hot take of the episode on the day of the episode uh, with my with the show notes as well. So as a patron supporter, you get early access to content and um, things like show notes and various bonus extra content for being a supporter of the show. So definitely check that out and support the show there. So my current plan from here is to rewatch this episode one more time. I have watched um, most of the episodes twice, so I am going to rewatch um, this episode a second time as well, and then do a follow-up review for the season. Um, probably not as long as this one, but just my overall thoughts of where it went and what they did and all of that. So just a quick recap of kind of my thoughts and feelings of the season and what I now hope for the third season, especially since we did not get Thrawn in this season. Um, so that is all there is for this particular review. Thanks for tuning in and until next time.